It was about a week ago when I first dreamed about killing my husband. In the dream, we were sitting in our little breakfast nook, eating bagels and drinking coffee, which is something we typically do when we first get up on the weekends. I had gotten up to get the cream cheese out of the fridge and was coming back to the table, a tub of cream cheese in one hand and a butter knife in the other, when I suddenly dropped the tub and leapt onto my husband. My butt banged painfully into the table, shoving it back and sending coffee and bagels everywhere, but I didn't care. I was intent on driving the butter knife deep into the soft flesh of his abdomen. It was surprisingly easy, given the dullness of the knife, and when I woke up, I remember feeling a dim sense of satisfaction at my bloody work. Then it transmorgified into horror and disgust as my waking mind surfaced from the black and murky waters of sleep, and I immediately turned and looked to find Ronald, my sweet husband of nearly 15 years, sleeping peacefully beside me, unharmed. I was initially shaken up by the dream, but out of some combination of guilt and wanting to tell him an interesting story, I told Ronald about the dream at dinner that night. He listened intently, and I was worried it was going to hurt his feelings or be misconstrued as some subconscious sign of marital problems that weren't there. But when I got to the part about me walking up and checking on him, he just roared with laughter. Wiping his eyes, he told me not to worry about it. Dreams didn't mean anything, and it was probably just a sign that I was stressed or had eaten something that didn't agree with me. In the moment, I'd agreed with him, feeling a sense of relief after worrying about it all day, but then, that night, it happened again. This time we were in Ronald's car, though. I was driving, and if I remember right, we were on our way to go see a movie. One minute we were talking about reviews we'd read on the thing, and all this and all that, and next I'm repeatedly stabbing him in the left side with an ice pick. I had apparently hit it in the driver's side door pocket at some point earlier. He was screaming in pain and I almost lost control of the car, the wheel jerking this way and that before I managed to get a decent grip with my blood slick hands. I managed to get the car stopped half a foot from the ditch and I looked over to see the ice pick still sticking out from under his armpit, blood squirting out around it in time with his dying heart. I started to yell and then I was awake again. This time I woke Ronald up. His expression confused and irritated as I asked if he was okay. He said he was, and I could tell he wanted to go back to sleep. But instead, he stayed awake long enough for me to tell him my dream. By this point, I was so upset that telling the story felt akin to popping a blister. The pressure inside me had to be let out, and talking to him was the only way I knew how. So he listened, groggily, as I recounted my second time killing him his expression becoming more serious toward the end. Look, Patricia, I can tell you're upset about it, but it's really nothing. People have repetitive or similar dreams all the time, and yeah, it'd be nice if you'd stop dreaming about murdering me. He chuckled at this part, but went on. But it's not the end of the world or a sign that something's wrong. You, you probably just have it on your mind, that's all. Try and let it go, and I bet the dreams go away. It sounded good in theory, and I did try not to dwell on it throughout the day. That night I took a sleeping pill in the hopes that I would get a good night's rest and have a dreamless sleep. Instead, I dreamed that I shot Ronald in the chest as he was getting out of the shower. By this point, I was pretty much a wreck. I made an appointment with a therapist for the following week, and I kept quizzing Ronald on any strange behaviors he'd seen from me, any signs I was having a mental problems or some kind of brain tumor or something. That night, he finally just slid over and hugged me, holding me as I cried against his shoulder. I felt like I was losing my mind, and I loved him so much for being so understanding. Looking back now, I realize I smelled the strange waxy smell even then, but at the time I was too focused on my worry and guilt to realize it. That night it was a thin, braided wire held tight against his neck as I kneeled on his back and sawed back and forth with all my strength. This happened in our bed, with him on his stomach and thrashing about for air as blood began to soak the sheets. I woke up in a cold sweat, and after checking on him, I went into the living room, my whole body shaking. It's 
stayed there until he woke up and came down in the morning, and that's when I told him I was going to sleep in the guest room until this was resolved. I didn't know if it would help anything, but I had to try something until I could talk to a doctor. Ronald didn't like it, but he agreed. He suggested I stay home from work for a couple of days and try to relax, but I couldn't. Work was the only real distraction I had. Besides, if it keeps on like this, I may need any leave time I had cured. I found myself googling the steps needed to voluntarily commit yourself. I didn't love the idea, but something was terribly wrong and I didn't know if I trusted myself around Ronald with things as they were. That night, Ronald had a work meeting that was going to go late, so I decided to do some cleaning. I had all this nervous energy, and while the house was not that messy, my hope was that if I tired myself out, maybe I could go a night without dreams. I scrubbed down the kitchen and the bathrooms, and then I went to change the sheets. As expected, the mattress showed no signs of the bloodbath from the dream where I'd gared it in the bed. But that wasn't the only blood that was missing. Back two years ago, I had a sinus infection that gave me terrible nosebleeds. One night, I had bled out onto the bed before I woke up, and when I checked the mattress later, there was a dime-sized circle of dry blood stained onto the edge of the mattress near the seam. I never mentioned it to Ronald, but I always noticed it when I changed the sheets. Now it was gone. I scoured the surface of the mattress, thinking I was either misremembering the exact spot or just overlooking it, but there was nothing. Then I flipped over the mattress, but it was clean as well. While it looked just the same, this wasn't the same mattress. My stomach began twisting in hard knots as I paced around the house. I didn't know what to do. I knew something was going on. I was afraid I didn't have enough proof to confront Ronald and learn if he knew more about it. When he came home, he seemed normal as always, giving me a sad look when I went to bed in the guest room. That night I dreamed that I stabbed him in the back with a butcher knife, the handle partially breaking as I hit his ribs and spine. But I kept going, my hands still curled as though they were holding the knife when I woke up in a panic. I lay there, sweating and crying for half an hour before I realized I hadn't checked on Ronald yet. He was sleeping soundly when I looked in on him. In the last few days, he'd taken to wearing these high-collar, long-sleeved pajamas I'd got him for Christmas a few years back. This was different than the normal t-shirt and shorts that he would normally wear to bed. I hadn't thought anything about it at first, other than maybe he was trying to make me feel better by wearing an old gift he never really liked. Now, though, I wondered. The weather was warm, and the pajamas covered more, not less. I started edging toward the bed, having some irrational desire to really check him out and make sure he was okay. As though he could be lying to me about having been shot and stabbed and choked to death. I was less than five feet away when the floor betrayed me with a wooden creak. I looked down at my feet for a moment, and when I looked back up, Ronald was looking at me. Another dream? I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. He nodded back and began getting up. I'm sorry, honey. I know it's hard on you. I think it'll be over soon, one way or the other, but... Just try to stay strong for now. He glanced at the clock, which read 5.32. I think I'm going to go ahead and get up. I got some stuff I need to get done early at work. He looked back at me. You okay? I cleared my throat and looked away. <clears throat> yeah. I think I'm going to take a mental health day today, though. Try to figure some things out. Ronald reached out and patted my shoulder. Sounds like a good idea. Just try and relax. An hour later, he was gone, and I was in the bathroom inspecting the shower. It had occurred to me after I'd woken up from the last dream. 
When I shot him in the shower, I remember the bullet going through his arm and chest and hitting the tile wall of the shower, sending a spray of porcelain out on impact. So, I started looking at the tiles around the height that the shot would have hit, and it didn't take me long for me to find what I was looking for. One of the tiles was new. It was a very close match, but you could tell it was slightly brighter than the rest of the grout and it was fresh, despite someone's efforts to make it look worn and discolored with age. I could barely hear my own thoughts, for the static buzz of panic in my ears. I went to the breakfast nook and looked for any signs of that attack, but I found none. I guess there would likely be something overlooked in his car, given all the nooks and crannies, but even if I could find it, I wasn't sure where I could get lengthy access to it without risking Ronald finding out. I almost called him right then to confront him, but decided against it. First, I needed to check the house over for any other signs of what was going on. Really search from top to bottom before he or whoever was doing this to us knew that I'd caught on. I spent the next six hours going over the house, and I was almost ready to give up. Exhausted and smelly, I was doing a final sweep of the attic when I noticed something tucked away in the far corner. It was a small duffel bag that I'd never seen before. Inside it were some tubes and cases of makeup and brands I'd never heard of before with two large jars of something called restorative wax. Carrying the bag downstairs, I got on the internet and looked up the items from the bag. The makeup was commonly used in funeral homes to prepare bodies for viewings, and the restorative wax was something undertakers used to cover up wounds on a corpse. I ran to the bathroom and began to vomit. That's likely why I didn't hear Ronald come in. He'd taken off early to come check on me, and when I saw him standing in the doorway to the bathroom, looking down in concern at me, huddled against the toilet, I screamed. Both from surprise, and for the first time since I'd met him twenty years earlier. Fear. I recoiled against the bathtub at the side of him, telling him to stay back. He frowned sadly. I, uh... Saw the duffel on the table when I came through. I guess you've figured out some things and I have some explaining to do. His expression was sheepish, as though he'd stayed out late drinking with friends and forgotten our anniversary. I was at a loss for words. See, I've been going through a period of personal and spiritual growth of late. He raised a hand. I haven't been trying to keep it from you, sweetie, but some of it... Some of it's fairly out there, and I didn't think you'd understand until I could show you results. I stood up shakily. Let me out of the bathroom. When he started to protest, I glared at him. Let me out of this fucking bathroom, and then we will talk. He nodded and stepped aside with a furrowed brow. I bolted past him, reaching the door of the bedroom before stopping and turning around. Okay. You stay fucking there and you tell me what's going on. I was going to stop there, but then I heard myself blurting out. Are you dead? Ronald let out a short burst of laughter before catching himself. <laughs> Shit. Sorry, no, I, I'm not dead. Not anymore, at least. But that's what I'm trying to tell you, you see? Did I fucking kill you? Like, several times? He sighed. Yes, technically, you did. But it's okay. With this new thing I'm a part of, I come back. But still, I know how hard this has been on you. I've wanted to tell you so bad, and I swear, only a few more times and it would be finished. I felt dizzy. Like my head had been stuffed with cotton soaked in rum and cocaine. Putting my hand against the bedroom door for support, my teeth gritted from both my anger and the effort to stay in the conversation at all. A few more times? You fucking bastard, what are you talking about? How have you been getting me to do it at all? 
He raised his hands in a placating gesture, taking a step forward before retreating at my glare. It's part of the process. My new friends, they've developed ways to facilitate all this. You, you don't understand. It has to be you. It won't work nearly as well if I was being hurt and killed by someone I love, but there's no one I love as much as you. When I just stared at him, he pushed on. Look, they've been controlling you at times during the night. They told me you probably wouldn't remember, but when you had the dreams about what you did after we put you to bed, I figured we could just push through it. But you kept having them and getting more upset, and now I can see you figured out some of it. He rubbed his eyes. Two or three more times. That's all we need. And you'll see what I become and you'll understand. You want me to do it to you and I will because you're my best friend and I want to share this with you. I pushed down the urge to vomit. Stop. Just stop. I don't know what crazy sick shit this is, but I want no part of it. I don't know if I even believe any of this shit at all. He smiled sadly. I understand. Let me show you. He started unbuttoning his shirt, but then he paused. Now, don't judge this too harshly. I know it'll look bad, and this is largely because we're only partway done, but just try not to get too scared or judgmental about it. Work in progress and all that. Ronald continued taking his shirt off, and immediately I could spot a couple of different spots where the restorative wax and makeup were starting to slough off his multitude of wounds. At first I thought it was just due to him moving around and sweating, my brain dealing with this impossible horror in a strangely detached and clinical way. But then I realized it was because something was pushing out the clay and makeup from inside the wounds. Within a matter of seconds, several molted brown tendrils raging from one to three inches snaked their way out of the wounds on his torso and neck. They glistened in the late afternoon light coming through the window as they whipped back and forth with a shared rhythm and cadence. I felt something start to give in my mind as I took to them. And then I realized Ronald was smiling, his arms extended as he's walked toward me. Aren't they beautiful? I ran. I flew through the house, snatching up my purse as I bolted for the door and out to my car. Ronald didn't immediately follow me outside, but as I was driving away, I saw him walk out into the road. His shirt was back on, and he was wearing a forlorn look as he watched me go. That was two days ago. Since then, I've been staying in a motel room over a hundred miles away, trying to figure out what to do or who to turn to. I've still been considering strongly that I'm insane, but when you listen to the voicemails that Ronald Lee is full of, I'm sorry, and you'll come to understand I'm not sure I'm hallucinating at all. I do know that I haven't had bad dreams for the last two nights, but I'm not sure how long that'll last. Two hours ago, there was a knock at the door to my room. It was Ronald. I didn't respond, but he stood outside and talked to me through the door for over ten hours minutes. He was telling me how much he loves me, how he regrets not being more open from the beginning, how he'll make it up to me. But he was also saying that he had to finish it now, or it would go bad for him. Bad for both of us. That the people he was tied up with, they were wonderful souls, but they had a very low tolerance for mistakes and half measures. He said he could feel the things inside of him growing restless and unsatisfied. That they needed him to be complete. That they couldn't understand why there had been two days without any progress. He said he could tell they were unhappy because they started to bite him a lot more often. He left the door after that. But when I look out the window, I can still see him sitting outside at the edge of the parking lot. He looks so sad and alone, and even from a distance I can tell he's lost weight. Every few seconds I see him grimace and shift uncomfortably, and I can only imagine what those things are doing to his insides. If I try to leave, he may try to stop me. I could call the police, of course, but is that what I want? Or do I want to try and help him, despite all that's happened? I know... I love 
love him and it's painful looking out there and seeing him waiting for me. I know that if he comes back scratching at my door again, I'm afraid I might let him in. Up until last month, I'd spent the last three years working as a property inspector for a national real estate company. They had over 500 houses across the three-state region I covered. Between me and my boss, Willie, we were supposed to check at least once out every two months. That meant making sure that there were no leaks or notable wear and tear, no problems with water or electrics where they were turned on, and of course, making sure no one was getting inside and either squatting or vandalizing the owner's property. It wasn't a bad job. And while the work had been described to me as a part guard, part plumber, and electrician, honestly it required very little beyond showing up, taking notes, and pictures if I saw something that looked weird, and then reporting it to Willie. Simple stuff we might wind up doing ourselves, but the company had specialists for anything more complex or dangerous. And as for trespassers, I'd never found a single one my entire time working there. But then, eight months ago... I went into a house that was new on our rotation. This wasn't unusual, of course. While some properties seemed stuck in some permanent limbo of not being rented or sold, there was a fair amount of turnover with most of them, and every two-month rotation inevitably brought some different houses with it. From the outside, this one wasn't particularly noteworthy. It was a single-story ranch house with faded white vinyl siding that went back further than you'd have thought from the street. To quote a common Willieism, it had a real ass on it. The yard was in decent shape, though I could already see recommending whoever was cutting it coming by more often before the house started to be actively shown. And while I could use a good pressure washing, a circle of the exterior didn't lead me to check off any problem spots or needs for repair. And then I went inside. Opening the door and crossing the threshold into an empty house can feel a variety of ways. Most aren't really noteworthy at all, beyond a bit of stale air. Some places are stifling hot or unexpectedly cold, musty or just thick with the dust and the stench of roach or mouse droppings dying in the shadows. But this place... When I stepped through the front door, I immediately noticed the air felt thicker, inside, almost as though I jumped off the edge of a pool into water and was now trying to walk along the bottom. I felt a moment of panic at the sensation, reaching for the light switch before remembering that the electrics were still off here. The house had been bought at a foreclosure sale, and it might be weeks or months before the company got around to turning utilities back on and putting the house with one of its agents. Muttering a curse, I dug out my flashlight and turned it on. It was early afternoon outside, but you couldn't tell it in here. Everything was murky and gray, the beam from the light seeming dim and feeble as it pushed out of the shadows, crouched in every corner. Grumbling, I pushed my nerves down. I'd gotten over the unease of going into empty houses in the first couple of weeks of doing this job, and I wasn't going to freak myself out now. I wouldn't find anything different in this house than I had in a thousand others, and if I did, all I had to do was leave and call Willie. It wasn't a big deal. Walking down the front hall, I turned to the right. Brownish-looking carpet and bare yellow walls. No sign of any damage or anything having been left behind. This place had 12 rooms, according to the sheets, and I tended to work front to back, so before going through the door in the back wall of that room, I crossed over the main hall into the left-hand room. This was a smaller room, also brown carpet, green walls, nothing of note. Moving through the door on the far side, there should be one more room. A larger living room area that... I paused in the doorway, as my flashlight landed on something. It was an old rocking horse, with a wooden body and rockers of peeling black paint and molded plastic head that was faded with age but still identifiable as the snarling black face of a stallion. The leather saddle on the back of the horse is what stood out the most. 
Unlike the rest, it seemed to be in very good shape, with the luster of the dark brown skin seeming to almost glow under my light. The embossed golden lettering above the left stirrup was legible even at a distance. Nick's best steed. I felt my stomach tighten slightly. Something wasn't right here. It wasn't uncommon to find some trash or other things that the house cleaners had missed on a first inspection, but how would they miss something like this? Stepping back through the other room and into the hall, I reached for my notepad and hesitated. Normally, I would write things down as I found them, but I didn't want to here. I didn't like the idea of focusing my attention on anything other than my surroundings, of making... I hesitated and then forced myself to finish my thought making myself vulnerable. Clenching my jaw, I stepped further down the hallway. I knew I was being stupid, but it didn't matter. Nerves had me now. I needed to finish doing a quick sweep of the house and just get out. The fourth room was empty. The fifth and sixth were the same. Then in the seventh room, there was a television sitting in the middle of the floor. It was a pretty old one, with a small curved screen of thick glass surrounded by a heavy wooden cabinet. How the hell had they left this sitting here? I felt a dull sense of fascination looking at it. It was really old and kind of interesting. Probably an antique that might be worth something to somebody, even if it didn't work. Crouching down, I gave the large metal channel dial a twist, each number between one and nine, making a satisfying click as it ratcheted by. Shining my light back across the front, I stopped when I reached the screen. The glass... The glass had lines, ridges in it. Six lines trailing down as though someone had run their fingers through clay, though these marks looked as though they'd been made by something melting their way into the glass as they went. I shivered and stood back up, my momentarily forgotten fear back stronger now. It was nothing. Plenty of houses had weird stuff left behind, right? Still, I was ready to be done and get out. Glancing around the room again, I moved on. Room 8, clear. Room 9, the last one of the right side of the house so far as I could tell, had some peeling wallpaper, but... No signs of water damage or mold behind it. I crossed back over the main hall into room 10, and at first, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. Then I turned to look in the corner and saw the naked man crouched there, grinning at me. In that first moment of shock and panic, I took him in fully. His head was crudely shaved, with thin patches of hair still wisping away from a scalp covered in cuts and scabs. His face was thin and lean except around his eyes, which were red and puffy. Even now, as he stretched cracked lips wide to show me twin rows of gray teeth, he was crying, his body shuddering with a faint sound somewhere between a laughter and a sob. Oh, fuck. Fuck, no. The next moment I was running for the front door, and I didn't stop until I was back outside and in my locked car. I called 911 then, waiting in my car for the cop to come and get out the trespasser. It took half an hour before someone showed up, and when they did, they looked skeptical. I made the mistake of telling 911 that not only was there some guy in the house, but he was naked and crying. At the time, I thought it'd make them come quicker, but instead it made them think it was some kind of practical joke. The officer was polite, though, asking me a few questions before telling me to wait outside. I could tell by his expression he didn't think he'd find anything, and as soon as he stepped back out, I could see that his suspicions had been confirmed. Still, when he came back to the car, I forced myself to ask if he saw the guy. He offered a slight frown. No, no sign of anyone in there right now. He gestured toward me in the car. You've been here the entire time, you said? Since you left the house? 
when I nodded he frowned. Well, this is the only door in and out that I saw, so unless he climbed out of a window, I don't know where he would have went. He let the unspoken implication hang in the air for a moment before giving me a shrug. Still, let us know if you have any further problems, and they'll send someone back out. I wanted to argue, to try and convince him, but I realized there was no point. What can I say, and, and what did it matter? I was done for now, and when I went to talk to Willie, he'd know if there was anything else we should do. He'd been working that job for over 30 years, and there was very little he hadn't seen, after all. Where'd you hear about it, kid? The internet? I stared at Willie in confusion. We were at Brecken's, a diner we met at once a week to eat breakfast and compare notes, and I just finished telling him about the house and what I'd found there. I'd known his expression had changed as I talked, but at the time I just talked it up to him being concerned about what I'd seen. Now that I was done, though, he seemed not only tense, but almost angry. What are you talking about? He took a sip of coffee as he studied me over the cup. Look, I'm not calling you a liar. But if this is some prank you're trying to pull, just tell me now. I won't be mad. Where'd you hear about the hollow house? I stared at him blankly. Willie, I... I don't know what you're talking about. I swear. What's the hollow house? Sitting down the coffee, he sighed. I believe you. You're a good kid, and I've never known you to be a bullshitter. And hell, I don't know if anyone talks about it on the internet in the first place. I just figured that it might be on there somewhere like every other damn thing. He gave a small shrug. I learned about it at first, same time as you. Twenty, maybe twenty-five years ago. I went to a house that, on the outside, looked just like the rest. And then I saw the TV. Back then it wasn't so old looking as it would seem now, with everybody having giant things they hang on their wall, but it was still old and odd that had been overlooked. I felt my eyes widen. You mean you saw the... He cut me his look that said, hold off asking questions until he was done explaining something to me. I fell silent. Rubbing his eyebrow, he went on. Then I saw the rocking horse, just like you described, down to the Nick's best steed and everything. By this point, I was starting to get skittish, but I was quick to get spooked back then, and I told myself that's all it was. His hand trembled slightly as it trailed down to clasp the other one on the table. But then, I saw the man. We didn't have cell phones back then, and they encouraged us to threaten people and bully them out when we could. Not hurt him, but make them seem like we might. He shook his head and looked down at his coffee. <laughs> the guy just kept staring at me laughing and crying at the same time, just eyes locked on mine while I got his face and yelled. Told him I'd have to rough him if I had to. Willie gave a bitter chuckle. <laughs> All the while trying not to piss myself. He brought his gaze up to mine. That's when the guy's eyes shifted away from me. He was looking at something behind me now. In spite of myself, I couldn't help but break in and ask. What was it? What was behind you? Willie's face visibly paled. No, I, I don't want to talk about that. Looking away, he licked his lips. Anyway, I got out. Went and told a buddy of mine that worked for the company what I had seen. He'd heard of it before, too, and he knew what people called it. The Hollow House. I frowned. Okay, uh, if this is all true and you knew this place was messed up or haunted or whatever, why didn't you warn me before I went there? He gave me a little smile and shook his head. <laughs> you don't understand. It's not the same house. It's never the same house, at least on the outside. Never in the same spot, same past owners, nothing. Believe me, 
I've looked into it some, and over the years, I've talked to half a dozen people that have run across it too. Every one of them described seeing the same stuff on the inside, but they were in different houses all around the country, all over the past 30 or 40 years when it happened. Sitting back, I let out a slow breath. How is that even possible? What is it? Willie spread his hands out and gave a deeper shrug. I have no idea. Not keen on finding out either. Leaning in, he lowered his voice slightly. That's why, the couple times I've run across it since, as soon as I know where I'm at, I back out. And from then on, that place gets my stamp of approval without me getting any closer than riding by to make sure it hasn't burned down. He held my gaze only for a moment. And that is exactly what you need to do. I nodded, but I could already feel my stomach tightening. I... I don't know, man. I can't lose this job. E even if it's all real, maybe it's just creepy, right? Like you've never gotten hurt from it and... I trailed off as Willie unbuttoned his sleeve and rolled it up. The first time I found the hollow house, I left with this. Just above his left elbow was a scar. The flesh there, dark and hard like a shadow, had been tattooed across his skin. In the shape of a grasping hand. He reached over now and gripped my arm. It's not just a spooky story, kid. And you just got lucky this time. The five or six people that have told me about going into the hollow house. I've heard another dozen stories over the years about people that disappeared doing this job. How many of those do you think went into one of these places and didn't get out quick enough? I was nodding now, terrified. Maybe it was how scared I looked that caused him to make the offer. Look, I'll adjust our schedules, okay? Put that house on my rotation. I snapped back a little out of my shock. Willie, you don't have to. He was already raising his hand to stop me. No, no. It's fine. I'm used to it, and I know the signs well enough to get out fast. Besides, I don't plan on stepping foot in that place. As long as I've been here, no one's going to hassle me if they find a problem I didn't report. He pointed at me. Not that you can let your guard down. If you stick with this job, you'll run across it again at some point. Sighing, I nodded. Yeah, sure. But... Are you sure? When he looked at me this time, he only met my eyes for a second before looking away. Yeah, kid. I'll be fine. For the next few months, everything went back to normal. I knew from the schedule that Willie would have visited the Hollow House twice, but he never mentioned it, and neither did I. I was grateful to not have to go there myself or risk faking my inspections, but I felt guilty for passing the risks on to him. Still, every time I went to a new house, there was now a moment of fear and tension while I tested the air and looked for signs of something being off. Nothing ever was, but that nervous anticipation never left me entirely, and that was enough to take the edge off the guilt at what Willie was doing for me, especially since I felt sure he wasn't actually going inside. The next month, a new corporate policy came down from the national office. To ensure that every property was being reviewed thoroughly, we were to take at least three photos of the interior of every house we inspected, including at least one that had a laminated property form in the shot. These forms were in every house, listing the address, property ID number, and various other details like square footage and local agent contact information. Every form was unique and were usually taped to the counter in the kitchen meaning that you couldn't just use another form from another house. My stomach dropped as soon as I got the email. And when I checked the schedule, I saw that Willie was supposed to be checking the hollow house again two weeks later. Enough time for me to talk to him when we did our weekly meetup. For us to come up with an answer. Or if not, for me to at least offer to take the house back. 
No, kid. It's okay. I'll figure something out. I frowned. Look, I didn't want to go in there either. Maybe I can fake the pictures, right? Make a new copy of the form and take pictures of it taped to a different counter in a different house. Not like they'd ever know. He looked thoughtful for a second as he considered it and then shook his head. It won't work. They don't store the info on those forms in any computers we have access to, so we'd have no way of knowing some of that stuff, like the local realtor that's listed without seeing the form. Besides, I know the way those suits think. They started those forms five years ago, made a big deal about putting them all in the same place in the house and making sure every place had one. I wondered why at the time when they could just give the info to us and the real estate agents. Glowering, he stabbed at a piece of egg. What do you think they were already planning this shit? Took pictures of the forms on the counters, so if they ever decided to do what they're doing now, they'd have something to catch fakes. Isn't that kind of paranoid? Willie shrugged. And only if I'm wrong. And I don't put much past a man looking to squeeze a dollar. Hell, I don't think it's a bad idea if I'm honest. He sighed. It's just damned inconvenient. Well, I mean, I can go and do it then. It can't be bad in there all the time, right? How else would they ever put the forms in, sell these houses? His eyes flicked up to mine. I don't know that they ever do sell them. I've kept an eye on the ones i found over the years, and best I can tell, none of them ever actually get sold. They just drop off the list after a while. No idea why, and I'm not going to look if I don't have to. He nodded as he chewed. Still, you're right. Can't be like that all the time. Maybe I'll hit it lucky. I'll take a bunch of shots of their damned form when I'm there. Enough to dole out until I retire. Stomach in knots, I pushed out the question I didn't want to ask. Are you sure? Willie hesitated, and in that brief pause, he looked frail and old. When he spoke, his voice was steady, but barely above a whisper. Yeah, kid. I'm sure. I wanted to call Willie after his next check at the Hollow House, but I held off. I was going to be meeting him for breakfast the next day, and there was no reason to bug him or make it a bigger deal than it was already. Maybe the house had gone back to normal, and either way, he'd have to let me know if something had come up. Unless he never got back out. I tried to push the thought away, but I couldn't. Finally, I gave in, calling him that night. The phone rang several times, and each second I could feel it getting harder to breathe. What if something really bad had... Hello? Willie, thank God, man. I, I'm sorry. I, I just knew you had that house today, and I wanted to make sure you were okay. Uh, oh, yeah, it went fine. I sat down as relief flooded through me. Good, good. So you got the pictures you needed, right? It all went fine. I'm just real tired. Going to beg off meeting you tomorrow if that's all right. I frowned. Other than one time when he was down with the flu for two weeks, Willie had never missed one of our breakfasts. You sure, man? You need me to bring you anything? No, I'll be fine. Thanks. I need to go now. I went to say more, but I heard the click as he hung up. I worried about him over the weekend, but it wasn't until I got a phone call next Tuesday that I knew something was really wrong. It was from the regional office. I asked if I'd heard from Willie in the last few days. But he hadn't submitted a report since the middle of the week before, and they couldn't get him on the phone. Heart in my throat, I told them no, but as soon as I got back into town that afternoon, I'd go back out and check on him. Willie lived alone in a two-story house on the east side of town. 
The neighborhood had gone down in recent years, but Willie always kept his place in great shape. He told me once that he'd been terrible about keeping this place up when his wife was alive. Too much like his job, he said. Now that she was gone and with no kids or grandkids, he had lots of empty time to fill. So we decided on doing a better job of taking care of the house that she loved so much. I knocked on the door twice before ringing the bell, and I was starting to wonder if he was home, despite his car being in the driveway. Hitting the doorbell a second time, I called out. Willie? You in there? You sick or something? Still, no answer. Walking back off the porch, I debated what to do. Walking back off the porch, I debated what to do. I didn't want to bother him, but I didn't want him laying in there, sick or dying, either. Maybe I should call the... My eyes landed on a rock at the edge of the flower bed. Or something that looked like a rock, at least. Crouching down, I picked it up and gave a brief, humorless laugh. It was a hide a key. Sliding back to bottom, I saw the house key was nestled inside the molded plastic base. Willie might get pissed, but so be it. I wanted to make sure he was okay. Fishing the key out, I went back up to the door and put it in. The key turned easily, and calling out to Willie that I was coming in, I started to open the door. I'd only opened it a foot when I met resistance from the other side. Looking up, I saw Willie's haggard face peering at me from the gap. His eyes were red and wild as he stared out, and his skin had a sickly, sweat-sheen glow to it. He was really sick. Hey, sorry to bother you, man. You look terrible, are you... Get away. His voice was a hoarse croak, and... It didn't take long for me to see why. Black marks, the shapes of long fingers, banded his neck like a collar. I felt anger and fear welling up in my chest. Willie, what the fuck, man? Did someone hurt you? He squeezed his eyes shut, tears forming at their corners. No, just get away from here, kid. Don't come back. With that, he stepped back and shoved the door shut. I might could have stopped him, but I'd been transfixed by what I saw behind him in that brief glimpse into his house. By the time I realized what was happening, he'd already locked the door and slid home the deadbolt. My yelling and knocking didn't get any further response. I went back home and then called the cops. I asked him to do a welfare check. When I called back a couple of hours later, they said they'd gone by and spoken to Willie and he was fine other than being bundled up. Said he was fighting off a bug and stayed cold all the time, but that he didn't need them or his nosy co-worker bugging him all hours of the day and night. The cop then mentioned to me that 911 was for actual emergencies and that I should probably just leave the guy alone. And that's what I did. Willie never came back to work, and after a few more weeks, I quit myself. I had reached the point where I couldn't go into any new house, and it was only a matter of time before they fired me anyway. I didn't give up on Willie because of what the cops said, or even because Willie told me to go away. I tell myself that those would be reasons enough, but I know better. Willie was a good guy and my friend, and I should go back and check on him again whether he wants me to or not. But when my guilt is at my worst, when I'm close to driving over to the east side of town or giving Willie a call, something always stops me. The memory of that half-second glimpse into his house and the picture-perfect image of what I saw there gently swaying behind him. A faded, black rocking horse with a brown leather saddle polished to a high sheen. Between the seat and the stirrups, fine gold lettering so bright I could read it across the too thick gloom. Nick's best steed.